Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for coming out for your fourth lecture. If I had all those buttons, you know, with Henry Allen, I'd give you each one because I think you deserve some sort of prize. Um, I mean that. Uh, it means a great deal to see somebody at a fourth lecture. I was afraid that by the fourth lecture I might be speaking to myself, and that would be very interesting. Uh, the second point I wanted to make was that um, some of you undoubtedly are now a little more concerned about the historical past. I hope you are. I hope you haven't given up on history. And if you have become a little more concerned about your historical past, I hope that when you return to your churches, whether you're ministers in churches or active laymen, and if you have records in your churches, minutes, journals, diaries, that you consider sending them to the uh, Baptist historical collections here, either to be kept or to be Xeroxed, so that there's a record here. This evening I learned of a journal uh, which I think could be very interesting regarding the free will Baptist cause uh, in the Cape Sable Island area. Um, that is the kind of material that we need to have and if you know of any of this material, about any of this material, you can contact uh, the people in the, the Divinity College or Ms. Pat Townsend who is here, extremely able archivist in the Baptist Historical Collections, or you could talk to me. Um, we need to have records in order to understand the past. The historian uses material from the past. Evangelical religion, it is clear, shaped in a noteworthy way the contours of Nova Scotia development during the century following the outbreak of the American Revolution. There were frequent religious revivals during this period, revivals which affected most Protestant churches and most regions of the province. Not only were there revivals, there were at least three major reformations as contemporaries referred to them. Revitalization movements, to use Anthony Wallace's suggestive terminology. These so-called spiritual earthquakes, the first and second great awakenings in particular, were the religious means whereby thousands of Nova Scotia New Lights were transformed into Baptists, and Henry Alline's 18th century sect transformed into often warring free will and Calvinist Baptist factions. What is particularly noteworthy and somewhat puzzling in contemporary Canadian society is that this revival tradition has apparently had so little formative impact on the way in which many leading and articulate Nova Scotians perceive themselves or view their religion. And certainly the revival, revitalization tradition, which was of such great consequence in 19th century Nova Scotia, has gone largely unnoticed in central Canada and the West. For most central Canadians and Westerners, the maritime provinces continue to be social, economic, intellectual, and even religious backwaters of despair. Events of national consequence, or so the argument goes, have passed the Atlantic region by. Most Canadians are a people obsessed with size and abundance and with a dynamic Western thrust into the interior of North America. The maritime provinces in general, and Nova Scotia in particular, cannot really be fitted into this framework of success and growth. In recent years, I've become increasingly interested in the relationship of so-called evangelical Christianity in the United States and the evolution of American political culture, 
as well as in the possible symbiotic relationship between evangelical Christianity in Nova Scotia and the province's cultural and political values. Most American scholars see an important link between evangelical Christianity and American society, and many, moreover, are not afraid to probe into the core of this fascinating relationship. It is clear, as William G. McLaughlin has argued in Revivals, Awakenings, and Reform, that the evangelical tradition has been and continues to be a formative force in American life. For example, one cannot understand the essential nature of the American Revolution without first coming to grips with the spiritual and ideological underpinnings of the First Great Awakening. Nor can one appreciate the complex strands of pre-Civil War reform without realizing how significant the Second Great Awakening was. And furthermore, it may be argued that Ronald Reagan and much of American neoconservatism owe a great deal of their influence, if not their substance, to, w to what has often been referred to as the Fourth Great Awakening. Yet, in the Canadian situation, there has been, to my knowledge, little serious attempt made to examine the often fascinating problem concerning the relationship of evangelical religion and evolving Canadian society. Certainly in the Nova Scotia situation, I know of no recent or even older study. It is as though there is no interest in examining a possible relationship or else a sophisticated realization that there is none. But even if there is none, and the available evidence would suggest that there in fact is, then some scholar or scholars should be trying to explain why there is none. Canadians are always preoccupied with things American. Since the beginning of the century, it has been contended that American popular culture deepened the Canadian tendency to think of Canadian problems in American terms and it intensified the Canadian conviction that the continent was an integrated whole. Consequently, Canadians were rendered incapable of resisting the notion that the continent, North America, was an integrated and seamless whole. And in this manner, it has been suggested by Professor Alan Smith of the University of British Columbia, the way was prepared for the triumph of the continentalist ideology in the 20th century. But despite this, the so-called evangelical factor in Canada has never received the same serious scholarly attention that it has received in American literature. It may be that some Canadian scholars are not eager to be associated with a group which has unacceptable intellectual roots, or perhaps it is too closely tied to too many unpopular causes. Moreover, it may be argued few evangelical scholars or scholars sympathetic to the evangelical viewpoint in Canada have developed a deep concern about the way in which the Canadian historical past has shaped the present. Or if they have, they have largely kept their insights to themselves. The strength and weakness of the evangelical tradition in Canada in general and the Baptist tradition in Nova Scotia in particular are, in my view, deserving of serious scholarly attention. They must be seen, of course, within the framework of contemporary Canadian and North American values. But they must also be explained within a historical context, one which includes the century of revivals, revivalists, and spiritual awakenings which connect Henry Alline to the 1850s when, it has been argued, the political and social culture of the province set and set hard. Exhorting, it may be argued, was far more influential than biblical preaching in actually bringing about and sustaining religious revivals 
in Nova Scotia, in Nova Scotia during the immediate post-Allied period. Exhortation, a complex mix of personal testimony, introspective prayer, articulated and inarticulated concern for the spiritual welfare of one's friends and neighbors, and tears, sobs, and often other forms of frenzied emotional behavior became a vitally significant ingredient in the colony's early evangelical religious culture. Preaching from a verse of scripture, but not from a prepared text, was the usual means whereby people in the congregation, young and old, male and female, rich and poor, sensitive and insensitive, were compelled to confront, in a general, almost impersonal manner, the inevitability of death, the eternal reality of heaven and hell, the need for salvation, and the crucial role played by Christ in linking the redeemed to the pristinely pure and righteous Almighty. Extemporaneous preaching helped to create a mood of anticipation. It also helped to focus the attention of the audience on those spiritual issues which preoccupied the preacher. To personalize these issues and to drive the jagged edges of their stark reality into the minds and hearts of the listeners, a special time of exhortation was always set aside at the end of each New Light and Baptist meeting. And sometimes, especially in the white heat of revival, the exhortation period stretched into the early morning hours. Anyone moved by the Holy Spirit could and did exhort. Exhortation, it should be stressed, was definitely not something carefully reserved for the male leaders of the congregation whether elders, deacons, or ministers. Exhortation, rather, was the readily available means whereby ordinary people, men, women, and even children, could witness publicly to their faith and, moreover, could attempt to precipitate conversions. They could, in other words, assert their own intrinsic importance test their spiritual gifts, embellish their preacher's gospel, and shape the contours of their community's values. And perhaps of greater consequence, exhortation gave them an opportunity to participate fully, creatively, and as equals in what most contemporaries agree was a movement not only of provincial consequence, but also one of cosmic consequence. In a very real sense, Henry Allein established what may be described as the exhortation paradigm, which his followers and many other evangelicals would religiously impose in the post-revolutionary period upon the religious life and practice of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Allein, however, was not creating something which was unique to his time and his location. Rather, he was applying, in his own peculiar manner, a New England New Light practice from the First Great Awakening and shaping it to meet the special exigencies produced by Nova Scotia's First Awakening. The first detailed description of the important role of exhortation in Alliance ministry is probably to be found in his journal entry for November the 20th 1782. After making brief stops at Yarmouth, Barrington, Ragged Islands, and Sable River, Alline had finally arrived at Liverpool. He observed, almost all the town assembled together, and some that were lively Christians prayed and exhorted, and God was there with the truth. I preached every day and sometimes twice a day. And the houses where I went were crowded almost all the time. Many were brought out of darkness and rejoiced and exhorted in public. And oh, how affecting it was to see some young people not only exhort their companions, but also take their parents by the hand and entreat them for their soul's sake to rest no longer in their sins, but fly to Jesus Christ while there was hope. 
Elline was particularly moved by a young lad who took his father by the hand and cried out, Oh, Father, you have been a great sinner and now are an old man, an old sinner with gray hairs upon your head going right down to destruction. Oh, turn, 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 dear Father, the son implored. Return and fly to Jesus Christ. There were, according to Aline, many other such like expressions and entreaties enough to melt a stony heart. There are at least three noteworthy characteristics dealt with in Aline's exhortation description, all of which I think became integral ingredients in New Life and Baptist early worship practice. First, there was a close linking of prayer and exhortation, yet a clear distinction between the two were nevertheless drawn. Prayer was oriented towards God, while exhortation was specifically directed at friends, neighbors, and associates. Second, it was not unusual for children to take the initiative and also to point their spiritual concerns at their parents. Such a public act must have been permeated not only by paradox, but also by bitter irony, as traditional deference was shattered as the young arrogantly led the old to salvation. Third, the verbal exhortation was often accompanied by the touching of hands, as flesh met flesh and his concern and love was expressed by close human contact. It is of some consequence that one of Aline's most vociferous critics, Jonathan Scott, denounced him for encouraging his followers to caress one another, using Scott's own words, by bombarding the passions of the young, ignorant, and, and inconsiderate with the pernicious sound and jingle of words. It would be a serious mistake, however, to give the impression that Aline both encouraged and facilitated the growth of what he called frenzied exhortation. Nothing could have been further from the reality of actual practice or of Aline's own view. Aline was suspicious, as I already have mentioned, of what he called counterfeit zeal. And he constantly chastised his immature followers for being so fond of everything that appears like the power of God that they receive almost anything that has zeal. It was therefore essential to distinguish clearly between what Alain called false zeal, based upon nothing but a spirit of self, and true zeal, based upon the spirit of God, and which moreover brings meekness, love, and humility with the zeal. For Alain then, Exhortation was not to be a wild, uncontrolled exhibition of religious enthusiasm. Rather, it was to be a carefully controlled means of personalizing and focusing the Christian message and also an opportunity for those who felt called to preach the gospel to test their gift and to gain valuable experience. It should surprise no one, therefore, that Thomas Hanley Chippen and John Paisan preachers who traveled with Aline and who exhorted after Aline's sermons, and men who would proudly carry his tradition into the 19th century, were concerned with order and were almost pathologically opposed to emotional excesses. Not all of Aline's followers, however, shared totally this preoccupation with good order, but even those who did. but even those who did not placed extraordinary emphasis on the crucial importance of exhortation. Joseph Dimmick, for example, who had been converted in 1787 at the age of 19, and who would serve as minister of the Chester Baptist Church from 1793 until his death in 1846, believed that ex exhorting was far more effective than preaching. He observed in 1797, People were loath to leave our place of public worship. 
I mostly converse freely after the meeting with those that are under conviction and others that give the opportunity, and I have found freedom in thus conversing. When I take persons by the hand and speak to them, they know that I mean them, while preaching in public may be turned on others, and I have thought that God blessed this particular addressing of individuals more than all the preaching I have done. Pudemic, exhorting was simply, as he put it, the particular addressing of individuals, both by word and by touch, and these sessions went on for one, two, or three hours right into the middle of the night. These marathon meetings must have exhausted and exhilarated those who were present, breaking down inhibition, helping to exacerbate guilt, exaggerating fears and anxieties, and sharpening the edges of expectation. Often those who remain to be exhorted in house, barn, or meeting house spend hours on their knees, their faces bathed in tears, reflected and distorted the flickering tongues of candles, desperately trying to create some flashes of light in the black sea of darkness. The eerie light, the often strange cacophony of sounds, the intense physical intimacy, the suggestibility produced by exhaustion and emotional excitement, the smell of bodies under stress. All of these factors combine to produce a mood of expectation. And preachers like Dimmick were able to transform this expectation into intense conversion experiences. For Dimmick, as he once eloquently put it, felt a weight of truths that flowed right from the eternal God into my soul, which has enabled me to communicate to others a sense of God and eternal things. It seems as though God was so near at these exhortation sessions to Dimmick's soul, yea, all around me, that I could see him in everything I beheld. The Almighty was there in the candlelight, in the stuttered murmurs of conviction, and the smells produced by bodies, buildings, and clothes. As had been the case with Aline, all sensory perceptions, all available stimuli were used to draw people to the heavenly charmer. A decade later, during Liverpool's Great Reformation, exhorting was widely perceived as being a key factor in bringing about the widespread revival. According to Nancy DeWolf, a resident of Liverpool in 1807, the revival was the most powerful reformation I ever was witness to. The 43-year-old woman who had been converted at Annapolis Royal by Harris Harding and Joseph Dimmick in 1789 went on to describe what she referred to as the New Pentecost. For about a fortnight, it was a Sabbath all over Liverpool. All labor ceased, vessels stopped loading, stores were shut up and all were inquiring what they should do to be saved. The meeting houses, Methodist and Congregational, were often open night and day. Indeed, every house was a meeting house by turns, for the power of God would strike them in their own houses and they would be converted in a few hours' time and go right to their companion or neighbor and say, God has redeemed my soul. He has taken me out of a horrible pit and miry clay and put a new song into my mouth. Even praise to God, come, my dear friend, share a part. There is room enough in my Father's kingdom. Throughout Liverpool, it was noted, little children were lisping out the praises of their God. Another eyewitness, the Reverend John Paysant, noted that during the 1807 Reformation, the old and young experienced the love of God and went and exhorted from house to house and telling what great things the Lord had done for them. Then on March the 3rd, at the conclusion of a night meeting at the meeting house, after the sermon was ended, many people in the congregation spontaneously started to exhort and to witness either crying for mercy under a sense of their perishing condition or rejoicing and blessing God for his goodness to them. 
they seemed to speak with one voice. As they declared that the Lord has appeared and delivered my soul, he has made an everlasting covenant with my soul, I shall sign with him to all eternity. The unconverted were single out for special individual attention. Names would be used, fingers would be pointed, as friends and neighbors were urged to come and partake with them of salvation. The unredeemed were told that there was mercy for them, for they had been the worst of sinners. On confessing their bad deeds, and after describing the precise nature of their new birth, the newly converted immediately turned to those persons, in quotes, that they had anything against and asked their pardon. All offenses were made up in the catharsis of individual salvation and community revival. Thus what Victor Turner has called the ecstasy of spontaneous communitas was channeled into something profoundly communal and shared. What was originally spontaneous with respect to exhortation soon became ritualized church polity. By the end of the first decade of the 19th century in Nova Scotia, in many of the New Light Baptist churches, exhortation was probably as important a feature of worship as was preaching or praying or singing. Usually exhortation took place after the extemporaneous sermon. Often exhortation blended into prayer, or prayer became exhortation, and also frequently the singing of spiritual songs or hymns added both emotional substance and theological richness and diversity to the exhortation experience. In some churches, lay people, usually six or eight of them, took the lead in exhorting others in the congregation. In other churches, exhorting was clearly the responsibility of the ordained minister and sometimes an elder. It's interesting to note that when the main Baptist itinerants, Isaac Case and Henry Hale, visited Nova Scotia in 1807 and later, they took turns in exhorting and in preaching. When Hale, for example, preached to a Baptist congregation, Case usually exhorted at the end of the service, and their roles were often reversed at the next meeting. Obviously, then, by 1810, in a very real sense, amateur exhorters were being replaced by professional ones. There are three possible explanations for this development. First, there was among Nova Scotia Baptists a growing preoccupation with order and respectability, a theme I've already tried to develop. And there was, moreover, a widespread concern, especially among the ministerial elite, that lay exhortation too often led to emotional excesses excesses which brought opprobrium to the evangelical cause in Nova Scotia. Ministerial leaders like Thomas Hanley Chipman and Edward Manning in particular were eager to transform their new light sect into a respectable Baptist denomination. Chipman, whose attitude to good order had been shaped by both Alline and the Reverend Samuel Stillman, the minister of the First Baptist Church in Boston, had emphasized as early as 1799 that he desperately wished to appear as respectable. He did not want to be a nobody, as he put it, in a peripheral sect, but rather somebody in a major denomination. And Edward Banning enthusiastically endorsed this position. Second, there is much evidence to suggest that by 1810, the ministerial elite, the Mannings, Theodore Seth Harding, and Thomas Hanley Chippen in particular, were keen to establish their authority over their denomination and also to assert their ministerial power. They were eager, in other words, to control effectively all aspects of their congregational life, particularly worship and especially exhortation. By weakening lay involvement and by dominating church life, the minister underscored their professionalism and their desire to transform Alain sect into their own unique church. It is interesting to note that James Innes, I would call him a New Light Baptist itinerant, believed in 1805 that Manning thought that every sheep should bow to his sheep. The independent itinerant was understandably furious when Manning, with Manning and told him my order was to salute no man, by the way, but to go as I was desired by the tender spirit of God. 
For Manning and others, Innes obviously represented a sectarian past which they wished to forget. By stressing his attachment to allying, moreover, Innes touched a raw nerve in people like Edward Manning and Theodore Seth Harding, not only because of their abandonment of Alanite principles, but also because of their basic questioning of the emotional underpinnings of the neo whitfieldian position. The third reason for what might also be called the professionalization of exhortation was the conservative New England Baptist influence. Three main Baptist preachers, in particular Isaac Case, Henry Hale, and Daniel Merrill, significantly influenced Baptist life and practice in Nova Scotia in the 1807-1810 period and beyond. Among other things, they pushed the somewhat reluctant Nova Scotia Baptist into a Calvinist and closed communion direction, reacting against not only the significant inroads being made by free will Baptists in their region, but also to attacks from the congregational establishment, these Baptist leaders were preoccupied with finding a middle ground between allying free will religious enthusiasm on the one hand and structured worship on the other. Viewing New England and Nova Scotia and New Brunswick as a seamless whole, they ruthlessly imposed their matrix of values and beliefs on people on both sides of the American border. Their Yankee order soon began to neutralize new light spontaneity. And this trend, together with the continuing anglicization of the colony, as represented by the influx of thousands of immigrants from Great Britain, did much to ensure that the mainstream of Nova Scotia Baptists drifted away from its Alanite tradition. By the time of the outbreak of the War of 1812, it may be argued, the so-called Allen New Light exhortation element of Nova Scotia evangelical religious culture had been significantly altered by evolving events and personalities. Nevertheless, exhortation, however distorted, remained an important ingredient in Baptist worship and practice throughout the early decades of the 19th century, and its importance has not received the scholarly attention it obviously merits. Exhortation may be perceived as a special ritual, whereby, as Victor Turner has brilliantly argued, well-bonded human beings have created by structural means, spaces and times in the calendar or in the cultural cycles of their most cherished groups, which cannot be captured in what he calls the nets of their routinized spheres of action. By verbal and nonverbal means, exhortation was the means whereby many Nova Scotians were able to break away from their innumerable constraints and boundaries and capture what has been called the floating world of creativity and self-discovery. People, according to Turner, alternate between fixed and floating worlds. They oscillate, in other words, between, on the one hand, being preoccupied with order and constraints, and on the other, searching for novelty and freedom. New Light Exhortation was the occasion for thousands of Nova Scotians to experience what has been called an anti-structural liminality. It became a symbol of the subjunctive social and religious mood in which all sorts of hitherto internalized and sublimated desires, dreams, hopes, and aspirations became legitimized. Women, for example, broke through the hard shell of deference to express deeply felt feelings and to criticize their husbands. Children often demanded obedience from their parents. Traditional behavior and traditional values were challenged. The anti-structural liminality of the exhortation ritual helped to give shape and form, however brief, to a profoundly satisfying, tender, silent, cognizant mutuality. In a sense, this aberrant behavior may be regarded as rituals of status reversal. Cognitively, it has been pointed out Nothing underlines regularity as well as absurdity or paradox. And emotionally, nothing satisfies as much as extravagant or temporarily permitted illicit behavior. 
the rituals of status reversal, moreover, as seen in exhortation, not only challenge community values, but also subconsciously reaffirm the hierarchical principle. There was, it should be stressed, an intensely satisfying and intensely pleasurable feeling of Christian fellowship as the ecstasy of spontaneous communitas overwhelmed the congregation. The spontaneous communitas produced by the exhortation experience had something almost magical about it. People, almost despite themselves, shared a feeling of endless power, and this feeling was both exhilarating and frightening. They were drawn by the mystery of intimacy toward one another as Christian love challenged what seemed to be a selfish, limited, almost worldly fidelity. They saw Christ in their friends and their neighbors, and they wanted desperately to love their friends as they loved Christ. Some did for a moment, the joy must have been glorious. They also realized that spontaneous communitas was only a phase, a moment, not a permanent condition, as the mystery of distancing and of tradition regained firm control of their hearts and of their minds but it was a return to the status quo with a difference, for things had changed. Religious life in Nova Scotia was an ongoing process, a process affected by other rituals and other symbols. Nova Scotia's second great awakening, it may be argued, if there was such a thing, stretched from the late 1790s to at least the War of 1812. And the 1806 to 8 period marked the spiritual and emotional peak of the revitalization movement. The awakening in Nova Scotia and also New Brunswick coincided with a similar religious movement sweeping through northern New England and other regions of the United States, as well as in Upper Canada. Nova Scotia's Second Awakening, it is clear, was an integral part of a North American awakening. There was a regular and steady flow of preachers moving both ways across the border, and to them the area was a seamless whole, and the the awakening a spiritual movement which could not be restrained by national boundaries. It seems obvious that a variety of socio and economic interpretations could also be applied to the second great awakening in Nova Scotia as they've been applied to the first awakening. It could be seen as a social movement continued by Alanite revivalists who were desperately searching for influence and power and eager to emulate their master or it could be viewed as an emotional reaction to the forces of economic and demographic change then engulfing Nova Scotia. The coming of some 20,000 loyalists and thousands of Scots had fundamentally altered the human face of the colony. Or the awakening could be regarded as the traditional outsettlement protest erected at Halifax, or else the socio-psychological means whereby the sect mentality was transformed into the church. Yet what particularly distinguishes the second from the first awakening is the striking absence of one charismatic preacher who almost single-handedly coaxes the movement into existence and then affects its development. Of course, the principal actors in the unfolding drama of the second great awakening, as well as crucial human links connecting Henry Alline's New Light movement with the evolving Baptist church, were preachers like Harris Harding, Dimmick, the Mannings, Thomas Hanley Chipman, all early and all enthusiastic disciples of the Falmouth preacher, at least until the turn of the century. What is remarkable in the Second Awakening is the key role played by children and women in bringing about various local revivals and also in shaping their emotional and ideological substance. Over and over again, the local church records, whether in Cornwallis, Liverpool, or Yarmouth, as well as the reports written by the revivalists themselves, underscore the importance of children and women. For example, in December 1806, Shipman reported to the readers of the Massachusetts Baptist Missionary Magazine 
that he had been in the Armouth Argyle region for five weeks and that such glorious times I never saw before. Multitudes are turned to God, he observed. I cannot with ink and pen describe the one half God has done. He went on, since the work began three months ago, there have been about 150 souls brought to own Jesus as their rightful Lord and sovereign King. We've had two church meetings and surely I never saw such meetings before. It was indeed the house of God and the very gate of heaven. The last Saturday we began at 10 in the morning, continued until 8 in the evening to hear persons relate the dealings of God with their souls and then a great number were prevented for want of time. A great many of the subjects of this work have been young people and children. Seldom a meeting, but some are brought to embrace the offers of life, sometimes five, six, or seven in a meeting. There are meetings in some parts of the town almost every day. In March of 1807, the Reverend John Paysant, Alang's brother-in-law, the only ordained New Light minister of Nova Scotia who had stubbornly refused to become a Baptist, noted that a number of women and young people on the geographical periphery of Liverpool had experienced conversion and were moving from house to house and telling what great things the Lord had done for them. There were nightly meetings and the young people were especially active. The Reverend Paysant was not at all involved at this early stage in what he described as a wonderful moving among the people of the power of God. Finally, on March the 3rd, what Paysant referred to as the fire began to kindle and the flame engulf the meeting house in a spiritual sense. At night meeting, as soon as the sermon was ended, the people began to shout from all sides of the house, either crying for mercy under a sense of their perishing condition or rejoicing and blessing God for his goodness to them. The sinners were cut down by the almighty power of God under a sense that they were in a ruined condition and the Lord has appeared for a number of them. Their language was, the Lord has appeared and delivered my soul. He has made an everlasting covenant with my soul. I shall reign with him to all eternity. And as soon as anyone came out, they could call to others to come and partake with them, telling them that there was mercy for them, for they had been the worst of sinners and acknowledging all their bad deeds. And if there were any person that they went to and asked their pardon, all offenses were made up and the meeting continued till day. The number that experienced the love of God in their hearts are not yet ascertained. There were more than 20 that came out clear, but it's thought by some that stayed all night that there were more than 50 who experienced the love of God. The next day, by the break of day, the streets were full of people of all descriptions, and it appeared that there was ten times as many people in the place as before. So it continued all day, they going from house to house. There was no business done that week, and but little victuals dressed. The people were so many, for there was old and young, rich and poor, male and female, black and white, all met together and appeared to be as one. At night, they came into the meeting house in that manner. The meeting house echoed with their praises and rejoicing so that there was no public singing or prayers. The whole night was spent in this manner. It was judged that there was above a thousand people. After the meeting, the assembled throng went from house to house. They were led by, in quotes, many small boys and girls, some of them telling the goodness of God, others in distress, end of quote, exhausted conscience-stricken, introspective, yet enjoying their unexpected influence and power, the young inhabitants of Liverpool continued to witness during the day to meet together at night. The adults at the evening meeting complained of the constant noise and the yelling. They wanted to hear sermons, and moreover, they demanded order. The young, enjoying immensely their newfound power and authority, refused to abandon what they considered to be practices sanctioned by the Holy Spirit. At the end of March, 44 joined the church. At that special service, more than a 1,000 people attended. The entire next week was spent in having meetings every night, the young people meeting in various places, for they were too numerous to meet in one place. Whenever a number of them met together, it was noted, the time was spent singing hymns and praying. The meetings continued until August when Harris Harding arrived. 
Harding obviously wanted to make Baptists of all the new converts. Paysan vociferously opposed the move, and the Reformation was replaced by bitter sectarian strife. Some, according to Paysan, were dipped in bitter water for baptism. It appeared, he uh, maintained, that they thought that to dip people in water was all the religion that was needed. Yet, there is yet another way to look at the Second Awakening, this time from the perspective of a backslider and from a woman. Nancy Lawrence was born in Lincoln, Massachusetts in 1764, and her career provides fascinating evidence of individual conversion, declension, and revival. Nancy's father, the Reverend William Lawrence, 1723 to 1780, a distinguished Harvard graduate, was an eminent congregational minister who had opposed throughout his lifetime religious enthusiasm of any kind. Sometime in 1788 or 1789, about eight years after her father's death, Nancy came to Granville near Annapolis to visit her loyalist brother William and sister-in-law who had recently moved to the township. While in Granville, Nancy became an ardent new light, having been influenced by Harris Harding and Joseph Dimmock in particular. She felt compelled to share immediately her newfound faith with her friends and her family, and it was a faith not insignificantly shaped by Alline's theology. Nancy had been overwhelmed by the riches of free grace to such an extent that without her mother's con consent, she abandoned her spinster status in December for marriage to a widower with three young children. Her husband, James DeWolf, a merchant from Horton, had, according to Nancy, a double claim to my affections, for he loves Jesus. We have a spiritual union that earth nor hell can never dissolve, which will outlive time and exist to all eternity. After briefly describing her deceit to her mother and requesting her forgiveness in a letter written on January the 5th, 1791, Nancy DeWolf quickly turned her attention to what mattered most to her, the salvation of her family and friends. Nancy's obvious distraught mother, a traditional Congregationalist, must have been both angered and amazed to have been instructed by her daughter to tell all her, their Lincoln neighbors that, in quotes, they must be born again or I shall be eternally separated from them, end of quote. Tell them, she informed her mother, tis not for any merit or worthiness in me that the Lord hath chosen me. No, tis free grace, free grace, free grace, and is free for them as for me. Give my love to Buckley Adams and wife, she went on. Tell him he must forsake all for Christ, or he is lost forever. Remember me to all my friends. Tell them that the friendship of the world is em enmity with God, that my soul loves and longs for their redemption. Nancy DeWolf, by her conversion and her marriage, had obviously declared her independence of her mother and her family. Though happily married, at least for the first few years of her marriage, Nancy found herself estranged from her family a family which was unable to condone either her religious enthusiasm or her secret marriage to a much older man. There is a sense of despair and acute concern in her letter written on May the 2nd, 1793, to her mother. "'Tis a year and a half since I received the line from the family," she complained, "'have only heard from you but once since early 1790." "'I want exceedingly to hear from each of the family," she confessed. Sometimes my heart forebodes a thousand evils and imagination points to stress and horror around that dwelling where first I received the elemental life. Eighteen months later, on October the 9th, 9, 1794, Nancy informed her mother, It is now almost three years since I received a line from any of the family. I conclude you have entirely cast me off. But God is my refuge, my refuge, my fortress, high tower, and exceeding great reward. He will not leave me nor forsake me. Nancy still had not heard from her family on April the 7th, 17th, 1795. Her mother, however, was constantly bombarded in the few letters written by Nancy with Alanite statements such as, Oh, that you may have an interest in that lamb which was slain from before the foundation of the world. Sometime between April 1796 and November 1798, 
the DeWolf family moved from Horton, the Alanite Free Light, the Alanite New Light Heartland, to Liverpool, where the Reverend John Paysant was the Congregational Minister. During this period, Nancy evidently lost much of her, her religious enthusiasm. Her mind, she graphically observed, was carried away captive into Babylon, and her heart was hung upon the willow. She now never mentioned experimental religion in her letters to her mother. Rather, she complained bitterly about her poor health and the frequent absences from Liverpool of her husband. There is nothing but a society, there is nothing but anxiety and trouble in this life, she moaned, and though we are prospered in our outward circumstances beyond our expectations, yet it appears to me all is vanity and vexation of spirit. All was vanity and vexation of spirit for Nancy DeWolf until Liverpool's Great Reformation. Until the early months of 1807, she was evidently far more interested in Liverpool's economic prospects than she was in evangelical Christianity. Then she experienced a profound spiritual revitalization. She had discovered a faith she had lost. Like many other Nova Scotians in the first decade of the 19th century, Nancy DeWolf had experienced first the ecstasy of regeneration and then the slow slide to religious apathy and indifference. And then came the revival to be followed for many, but not for Nancy, by declension and then another outburst of spiritual revitalization. In early February 1807, Nancy, together with hundreds of her Liverpool neighbors, were caught up in the great revival. For almost two months, Nancy attended special revival meetings at least four or five times a week. And by the first week of April, she had, she was certain, rediscovered the magic of her earlier faith during what she called the day of Pentecost. She wrote to her sister, it is thought there is 500 brought to the knowledge of the truth. I could write a volume, but I am afraid I shall frighten you, for I was so far from enjoying religion when I was with you. My mind was carried away captive into Babylon, and how could I sing one of Zion's songs in a strange land? But, oh, my sister, I can bless God. There is a glorious reality in experimental religion now. I can say this night with the energy of truth that I am a living witness for the cause of Christ. We must be born again or never enter the kingdom of heaven that we must be slain by the law and made or live by grace. Oh, that it might spread from shore to shore, that the knowledge of the Lord might cover the earth as the waters do the seas. For a two-week period, Nancy observed it was a Sabbath all over Liverpool. All labor ceased. The enthusiasm, energy, and confidence of the young convert struck a particularly responsive chord in Nancy as she remembered those days and months some two decades earlier when she too had been absolutely certain about the glorious reality of experimental religion. When she heard the young Liverpool converts witness to their faith, she heard her own voice echo from what seemed to be a distant past. She knew the words, she knew the phrases, and she understood the complex nature of the concern, for these were all once uniquely heard. What reverberated through her mind, ricocheting wildly into the darkest corners of her guilt, were the familiar, the painfully familiar reminders of a past when she was convinced that she had been suddenly and marvelously, with the ravishing power of the Holy Spirit, been made part of the Almighty. In March and April of 1807, the present was collapsed into the past as Nancy DeWolf confronted the bitter depths of her backsliding. God has redeemed my soul, she was told, over and over again by scores of young people. He has taken me out of the horrible pit and the miry clay and put a new song in my mouth, even praise to God. Come, my dear friend, she, she was urged, share a part. There is room enough in my Father's kingdom for you. It's clear that Nancy DeWolf's experience was not a unique one. Many Nova Scotians in the post-revolutionary period experienced the ecstasy of conversion and then the prolonged despair associated with backsliding. Some, during frequent revivals which affected their communities, would emulate Nancy DeWolf. 
these people, in a very real sense, were not reconverted, but rather were revived. For some, their being regularly revived from what they described as a state of spiritual stupor became the essence of their religious experience. Outside stimuli, they felt, were needed to keep the evangelical cause alive. Their inner resources appeared to be totally inadequate to accomplish this end. Dependence merely bred further dependence, and this too would become a distinguishing feature of both Nova Scotia and maritime religious culture. It may be argued that during the awakening there was a breathtaking reversal of roles as normally subservient and passive children and women enthusiastically abandoned their traditional deferential social role in Nova Scotia society, become almost the de, the de facto leaders of the community, and in a sense, the unchallenged source of moral and spiritual authority. It was relatively easy for these women and children to contend that they possessed the Holy Spirit and that they were specially selected conduits for the transformation of their community's values. Revivalists like Harris Harding and Joseph Dimmick in particular encouraged this development since they believed that it was an important legacy from Alline's time. Apparently quite a few Nova Scotia children, ranging in age from 7 to 16, saw in the revivals an excellent opportunity to assert their own sense of worth and self-importance. In a society which traditionally relegated them to positions of subservience and acute dependence, Harris Harding once described the confident way in which an eight-year-old Anne Eaton related her Christian experience in Yarmouth. She had given good evidence before this that she was a renewed person, Harding observed, and he, then he went on. She came forward, was placed on the communion table. She was very small for her age. The sight moved the people much. She told her experience, answered questions to satisfaction, and was received. The host of people were loath to leave the meeting. What is the God of heaven doing? It was a good question. But Harding never tried to answer it. All he knew with certainty was that only the Holy Spirit could have transformed the eight-year-old Ann Eaton into a mature, sensitive Christian. There is some evidence to suggest that many young converts often sharply and some would say unfairly contrast to the rhetoric of community Christian morality with the reality and in the process found their parents disconcertingly wanting. By stressing parental and adult hypocrisy and their own pure motivation, the children, with the explicit encouragement of the revivalists, were able often to become the cutting edge of the revival, pushing it in directions that some would say hubris and pent-up frustration was driving them. It was obviously a marvelously exhilarating experience for them. Women like the children also used the awakening to assert their own sense of importance in a world which also seemed to relegate them to positions of inferiority and subservience. In the revival meetings, they were given the opportunity to express their mostly deep, their their deeply felt feelings and attitudes as equals. And also, they often appropriated the power to control events. The Holy Spirit, as they saw it, did not distinguish between males and females. In their homes, the women in their roles as mothers, sisters, grandmothers, were conditioned to accept their role as second-class citizens. In the revival meetings, they emphatically were not. As Donald Matthews has convincingly argued in his fine study, Religion in the Old South, conversion and revivals provided women in particular with what he refers to as psychological and social space. Giving up temporarily the traditional web of cultural constraints, which significantly affected their behavior and sense of responsibility, many women sought in revivals the justification for independence and collective support for almost aberrant behavior. It was denunciation of the old life, according to Matthews, and the consequent devaluation of that life, which was especially resented by worldly husbands who did not share conversion and the conviction the old life was so bad and did not agree with the idea that their wives may have suffered from it. Many evangelical husbands probably felt the same way. As well, 
and this reaction would only add to existing tension and sense of excitement. The general alienation of the men may have been intensified when they realized that many of the women were almost irresistibly attracted to the visiting revivalists. <laughs> the repressed sensuality of a religion which emphasized love, care, and intimate companionship in Christ, it has been asserted, could easily mix sacred and profane desire into a volatile compound that provided women unaccustomed to compassionate, impassioned, even passionate men, such as the clergy seem to be, with an emotional experience they could not quite fathom, but which they knew excited and fulfilled them. It should be kept in mind that during the 1790-1812 period, most of the patriarchs were usually, were unusually vigorous and attractive young men. Edward Manning, for example, is a giant of a man, over six feet tall, who as a teenager had killed three bears in one violent confrontation. <laughs> How many of you are three bear men? <laughs> Manning was a man of great courage and muscular force. He and a friend, and I quote, were once traveling in the woods. His companion had a gun and he a hatchet. They came upon a bear's den which were three bears, I think one old one and two yearlings. He said that he asked his companion why he did not fire. He said, I'm afraid of killing the dog. Mr. Manning said, I will shoot something. I think one of the bears put out its nose and he cleft its skull. Another he struck on the back and severed its backbone so that he told me he could see the heaving of the, of the lungs through the incision. The third was making off and he pursued it up a rising ground and struck the hatchet into its skull when it screamed out almost like a human being and came tumbling down the hill. Like a description of uh, Edward Manning chasing uh, um, one of Aline's converts. <laughs> Harris Harding, Joseph Dimmick, Thomas Hanley Chipman, James Manning and Theodore Seth Harding were not three bear men and they were not as physically imposing as was Edward Manning, but in their prime, they were all unusually warm and affectionate individuals who possessed a powerful appeal over both women and men. Christian fellowship in the awakening took on a special meaning. As Matthews has stressed, evangelicals redefined social relationships in terms of social intimacy, mutual respect, and communal discipline. Intimacy was most dramatically expressed by the many ways in which evangelicals touched each other, offering the right hand of fellowship almost universally. They often prayed through personal crises with their arms around each other, and some greeted their brothers and sisters in Christ with a kiss. Perhaps even more intimate than ritualistic touching, however, was public confession of sin and sharing with others the deepest, most private thoughts about oneself and his relationship with other people and with God. These confessions, which often included fascinating detailed descriptions of events never previously discussed in public, stripped away the veneer of pious respectability and introduced instead embarrassing honesty which both convicted and titillated. Sometimes women were amazingly explicit about sexual matters and about their morbid introspection, but they were also not afraid to express their sense of spiritual liberation and freedom. They were not ashamed to express deeply felt feelings either by the spoken word or by touch. They needed to communicate their profound Christian love in an environment that both facilitated and encouraged such a development. A great deal of revival scholarship, it should be stressed, in the United States and in Canada has dealt almost exclusively with the preachers and the message, largely at the expense of the congregation. And when congregations are analyzed, they're usually done so from a distinctly male perspective. It is, as, it is as if women and children and young people do not even exist, but they do. And the evidence is quite convincing that they made up the vast majority of people affected by the Second Great Awakening in particular and all the Nova Scotia revivals. This central fact must inform any sensitive and sophisticated study of Canadian religious revivals and awakenings. 
Charles G. Finney, the outstanding 19th century American evangelist, once observed that a revival is not a miracle. It consists entirely in the right exercise of the powers of nature. The connection between the right use of means for a revival and a revival is as philosophically sure as between the right use of means to raise grain and a crop of wheat, end of quote. Not everyone, of course, in the 19th century or today would agree with Finney's analysis. But it's clear that as the 19th century unfolded in Nova Scotia, an increasing number of Baptist ministers began to feel that they could, as one of them put it, almost will a revival into existence. Some obviously needed a revival in order to assert their own spirituality and also their own sense of ministerial importance in a denomination that was rapidly expanding. The older Baptist ministers found themselves in the late 1820s and 1830s and early 1840s challenged by a new group of young evangelists, some of whom were eager to shoulder the backward-looking patriarchs aside in a province that was experienced what D.C. Harvey once correctly described as an intellectual awakening. During the so-called Third Awakening, the Baptist leaders, whether the new or old generation, stressed the importance of order and respectability. There was very little disorder to be seen at our meetings, the young Reverend Tupper observed from Aylesford in 1828. The Reverend Joseph Dimmick, then 66 years of age, reported from Chester six years later that there has been great solemnity, great freedom on the part of the converts in telling what the Lord has done for them. There has been no confusion. They have spoken one at a time. No preacher or private Christian has been interrupted in prayer or in speaking." End of quote. A year later, the recently ordained I.E. Bill wrote from Liverpool that there was no outcry, no confusion. There has been on those, uh, there has been on those occasions formerly more or less confusion, but now all was perfect stillness. The Calvinist Baptists were obviously trying to distance themselves from the Free Will Baptists who were beginning to make inroads in Nova Scotia, and perhaps the Calvinists were also endeavoring to declare their independence of Henry Lyon. On August, on August the 24th, 1821, the Reverend Edward Manning described one chaotic church service in this way. No sooner was I seated than a young woman, whom I know not, screamed out from the gallery, number below all females, a melancholy sound to me, because I thought there was much, such an extravagancy of voice and such uncommon gesticulations, leaving their seats, running around the broad aisle, swinging their arms, bowing their heads to the ground, stretching their hands out right and left, then stretching them up as high as they could while the head was bowed down to the floor almost. The young woman up in the gallery came directly to me with an awfully disfigured face, screeching very loud, indeed calling me, brother, oh my brother, oh my brother, until she was exhausted, and then she turned away. According to Manning, Alanism had made people in the Horton area generally more confounded than comforted. Manning felt it was essential for his Baptists to define their separate collective identity by behaving in a somewhat different Manning manner than the Alanite Free Will Baptists. <laughs> he did not want to abandon the Neo-Whitfieldian tradition. What he wished to do was to get rid of, once and for all, what he considered to be new light excesses. Some might argue that this response was merely the working out of uh, Manning's concern with order and respectability. Others would argue that the Calvinist Baptist remained overly concerned with his position in society, was eager to sacrifice his and his denomination's rich historical tradition in order to enter the mainstream of Nova Scotia religious life. It may be of some interest that in my examination of hundreds of local Baptist revivals in Nova Scotia in the post-1830 period, I have yet to find one characterized by what I would describe as undue emotional excess. There is nothing, for example, to match the barking, the speaking with tongues, the powerful convulsions which characterized the 19th century Macdonaldites uh, revivals on Prince Edward Island, the so-called the works as they were called. 
all these phenomena were regarded by the Baptists as being, as one of them put it, very wild and to be avoided at all costs. And well-ordered revivals as a consequence have become the Nova Scotia Baptist norm. Nova Scotia conservatism thus triumphed once again over Yankee enthusiasm. The Reverend Isaiah Wallace, Wallace's career, probably the best known Baptist evangelist in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick in the latter half of the 19th century, serves to underscore the accuracy of this conclusion. In the 1850s, New Brunswick, Wallace noted that the Spirit's mighty power in subduing the hearts of men was wonderful. The meetings were sometimes noisy and full of excitement, and being comparatively inexperienced, I found it necessary in presiding in the services to seek continually God's steadying hand. Never again in his descriptions of the many revivals in which he was intimately involved in the 1860 to 1900 period would Wallace ever use the word noisy. Evidently, the steadying hand was ever present, especially in Nova Scotia, to ensure, as he put it, this blessed work would be both ordered and respectable. In Nova Scotia, according to a public opinion survey conducted in 1977 by the Task Force in Canadian Unity, only 7% of the Baptist respondents had ever been positively affected by a religious revival, and little more than 2% by the charismatic movement. In New Brunswick, on the other hand, 25% of the Baptists had been positively affected by a religious revival, and only 1% by the charismatic movement. As far as the non-Baptist population in Nova Scotia was concerned, the corresponding percentages were 5% and 1%, and New Brunswick 7% and 3.5. The evidence suggests, to me anyway, that the Nova Scotia Baptist revivalist tradition, unlike that of New Brunswick, may have lost much of its hold on the denomination's ethos. It is a historical tradition of central importance, but also apparently a contemporary reality of growing insignificance. It is certainly disconcerting to observe that only approximately 11% of all Nova Scotia Baptists regard themselves as being either high or medium high in the area of perceived religiosity. And almost two out of three of the Nova Scotia Baptists consider themselves as being either non-religious or very low. Obviously, the denomination faces serious problems in the immediate future, despite the much-heralded neo-evangelical revival. But is this conclusion necessarily that obvious? Is there something especially inevitable about the secularization process? Social trends can always be checked or even reversed. And consequently, the next few decades in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick may see the Whig forces of progress and change switched back onto themselves by the unexpected and the unanticipated realities of late 20th century existence. As far as Henry Alline was concerned, the problems facing his Nova Scotia in 1775 and 1776 were far more distressing and far more disturbing than those impinging on the province in the fall of 1983. He found solace and inspiration what became one of his favorite texts, the first three verses of the 40th Psalm. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, Many see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. A few months before he died, Alain wrote to a friend, William Wells, Although the carnal world and dry Pharisee will account all pretensions to a felt knowledge of Christ, and the joys of the Holy Ghost is vain, yet it is the only joy and life of my soul in these trying hours when earthly friends, comforts, joys, and all created helpers prove abortive. 
all when all things else shall fail, Jesus is a friend, supporter, comforter, and everlasting portion and reward. I have been sometimes so weak in body, I could scarcely speak, and my soul would mount up and rejoice. Jesus made me strong in his grace. O oh, William, it is a religion that the world despises, but it is a joy unspeakable and life eternal to the, to the despised followers of Jesus. Despite everything, despite the survey results which I have given you, there is still hope for the despised followers of Jesus Christ. Henry Alline and his disciples knew why.